Let us pray. Almighty God, who pours out on all who desire it the spirit of grace and of supplication, deliver us when we draw near to you from coldness of heart and wanderings of mind, that with steadfast thoughts and kindled affections we may worship you in truth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. From the rising of the sun, even unto the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles, and in every place incense shall be offered unto my name, and a pure offering. For my name shall be great among the heathen, saith the Lord of hosts. Dearly beloved, we have come together in the presence of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at His hands, to set forth His most worthy praise, to hear His holy word, and to ask for ourselves and on behalf of others those things that are necessary for our life and our salvation. And so that we may prepare ourselves in heart and mind to worship Him, let us kneel in silence and with penitent and obedient hearts confess our sins that we may obtain forgiveness by God's infinite goodness and mercy. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. 
We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us. Spare thou those who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and merciful Lord grant you absolution and remission of all your sins, true repentance, amendment of life, and the grace and consolation of God's Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. O Lord, open Thou our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.
A reading from the first epistle to the Corinthians. I mean, brothers and sisters, the appointed time has grown short. From now on, let even those who have wives be as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no possessions, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first Gospel of Mark. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God, and saying, 
The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The word of the Lord.
Gracious God, uphold thou me that I might uplift thee. Amen. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Last year, St. James's sent me to an Episcopal Church conference in Atlanta. And while I was there, I attended a workshop for assisting clergy specifically. And as one part of the workshop, the leader asked us each to think about our favorite hobby, an activity that we love to do in our free time whenever we have it. And it was not supposed to be spending time with our loved ones. That didn't count. That was too cliché. We were to take this hobby or pastime that we love and use it to write a one-sentence personal mission statement for our working ministries. And I will admit, I had my doubts. I thought, well, this workshop was a waste of time. But I watched and I listened and as other people in the room started to get the hang of the exercise, and they came up with some pretty neat personal mission statements that drew on the language of their favorite extracurricular activities. There was a priest in the room who loved to cook gourmet meals, and so his new mission statement became to feed the people of God. There was another priest in the room who was passionate about photography. And she adopted a personal mission statement of looking through the lens of Christ to notice and capture the light. That one was good, pretty fancy. The priest who also coached a youth soccer team in his spare time crafted a mission statement for himself that was something about encouraging others to meet their goals. Yeah. And one of the priests there confessed to us all her love of bargain shopping. And even that was relatively easy to turn into a personal mission statement for ministry. Her mission became to help people seek out what is worthy from among what is not. I was not good at this exercise, though. I struggled. The first activity that popped into my head was snacking on popcorn and watching Downton Abbey. (laughs) But I was not sure how to turn that into a personal mission statement for my ministry. So I thought, some more about other activities in my life that give me great joy, going on walks, listening to bluegrass music, reading poetry. Um, But finally, I thought about how I would like to spend my time if I had free time and had the resources to do it. My favorite thing to do is travel. I've always loved a good road trip or a good plane trip as long as there's an adventure to be had on the other side of it. So I told this to my workshop leader, travel, that's mine. And he said, aha, your ministry is to go on a voyage of exploring faith with your congregation. So I liked it, it fits. Travel is a hobby, although I do some, plenty of it for work, but there is something about traveling that is at the core of who I am, and that's why it brings me so much joy. I've always been somebody who loves a good adventure. And so it makes sense now for me to think of my vocation in ministry as another form of traveling. Together, we're all just on a voyage of exploring our faith together. Now, it eventually dawned on me 
that this workshop leader was somewhat brilliant and that in this exercise, he had us doing, he was doing exactly what Jesus did when Jesus called his first disciples. Now, fishing was no mere pastime for Simon and Andrew and James and John. They lived in an era when people did not really have time for hobbies and other such frivolities. Fishing was their means of survival, their livelihood. Fishing was their core identity. Jesus comes along and he so brilliantly convinces them to join him by crafting for them a mission statement based on their primary pursuit in life. Follow me and I will make you fish for people. Jesus was smart. If they had been bricklayers, I bet he would have told them that he would make them lay the foundation for the kingdom. If they had been merchants, he might have told them that they would be peddlers of the good news. But they were fishermen. And so Jesus speaks to them using an image that makes sense for their context. Follow me and fish for people. I think this is really important. Jesus knowing how to hone in on our core identity. Because to follow Jesus, these disciples will have to give up quite a lot. They have to leave their nets and their boat and even their father, some of them. But Jesus does not ask them to give up their identity as fishermen. He does not ask them to change the core of who they are. He asks them, rather, to use their core identity as fishermen to live out their calling as disciples. They're not going to give up fishing. They're always going to be fishermen, even if the methods they use are transformed. The heart of who they are remains unchanged. For the longest time, I felt like I had to become someone new altogether in order to be a faithful Christian. I convinced myself that if I could just leave behind my former self, which was egotistical and sinful and broken, that I would be able to start fresh with Jesus and to follow him properly. But for some reason, I could never manage to stop being the Carmen who is both deeply flawed and deeply faithful. And that's okay, because I eventually figured out that God planned to use me as a disciple just as I am. Me not as some imaginary, perfectly pious future version of me, but me as I am. God is always redeeming us and always offering us opportunities for renewal, but we have been created as human beings with all of the beauty and all of the baggage that goes along with that. When Jesus calls me, he does not want me to stop being me. And when Jesus calls you, he wants you to be more you than you have ever been before. To follow Jesus is not to abandon our old identities, but to live into them more fully. To become a disciple is to take what is at your core and use it for the gospel. So, do you crochet? 
Follow me, says Jesus, and I will make you knit together the fabric of our community. And I will say that at 745, someone did point out to me that crocheting and knitting are not the same thing, but humor me. Do you sing? Follow me, and I will make you bring harmony to a world of dissonance. Do you run? Follow me, and I will make you chase after righteousness. Do you fish? Well, then have I got a job for you. So often, when we read the story of the call of the disciples, and when we focus on what they have to give up in order to follow Jesus, and yes, what they gave up is significant. Their comforts, their routines, their familiarity, their family. But what about what they gained? They got to learn from the wisest, most influential teacher that has ever walked this earth. They got to sit at the feet of God. They got to have adventures and see more of the world than the average Galilean ever would. They got to meet people from all walks of life and to witness how their lives were transformed by Jesus. They started out as followers, but they got to become leaders. They got to fish for people, and ultimately they got in this answering of this call, they got to live lives of meaning. And that is something that I believe all of us hunger for. When you become a disciple, you do give up some things. But you also, in that process, become more fully the person that God created you to be. The call of Christ is not convenient, but it is meaningful. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather live a life that is meaningful over a life that is convenient. It would be nice if we could have both, but I have yet to meet any true disciples who say that responding to God's call did not completely disrupt their lives. And yet it was worth it. I think this is what Jesus meant when he said elsewhere in Scripture that to gain your life, you have to lose it. When Jesus calls out to them from that lakeshore, Simon and Andrew and James and John lost forever the lives they had known. But they kept the core of who they were as fishermen, and in answering the call, they gained the lives for which they had been created. And so can we, if we choose the path of discipleship. Amen. Let us stand and reaffirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, 
the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Kneeling as you are able, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And do thy ministers with righteousness. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. Lord, keep this nation under thy care. Let thy way be known upon earth. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Create in us clean hearts, O God. Give us grace, O Lord, to answer readily the call of our Savior Jesus Christ and proclaim to all people the good news of his salvation, that we and the whole world may rejoice may perceive the glory of his marvelous works, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. O God, who makest us glad with the weekly remembrance of the glorious resurrection of thy Son, our Lord, grant us this day such blessing through our worship of thee, that the days to come may be spent in thy favor, through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O God, the King Eternal, who divide us the day from the night and turn us the shadow of death into the morning, drive far from us all wrong desires, incline our hearts to keep thy law, and guide our feet into the way of peace, that having done thy will with cheerfulness while it was day, we may, when the night cometh, Rejoice to give thee thanks, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. O Heavenly Father, in whom we live and move and have our being, we humbly pray thee so to guide and govern us by thy Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life we may not forget thee, but may remember that we are ever walking in thy sight through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, who did stretch out thine arms of love on the hardwood of the cross, that everyone might come within the reach of thy saving embrace, so clothe us in thy spirit, that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know thee to the knowledge and love of thee for the honor of thy name. Amen. In our parish family today, we lift up all those who are sick or in need, remembering especially Joseph Botolato, John Calvin Bernard, Ginny Cohn, Tony Donovan, Jenny Kassler, Wilbert Drummond, Radcliffe Anderson, Carlton Fuller, John Hagedorn, Carolyn Harrison, Ashley Bloomer Kolitz, Susan Lawrence, Lissy McMahon, Zach Means, Bill Reese, Alice Burwell Reed, Harvey Rosen, Rob Reynolds, 
Jenny Sherrar, Elizabeth Huff Sleeman, Sarah Spain, Melissa Teal, Robbie Wells, and Allison Wright. We ask your blessings on the marriage of Elizabeth Downey and Ben Rand, who were married here yesterday. And with gratitude for their lives and ministries, we give you thanks, dear Lord, for all those who celebrate their birthday today. Susie Peters, Craig Ganaway, and Tim Crawford. We bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, especially Barry Koval, who died recently, and Lewis Russell Lawson, Jr., Rosamond Sammons Lawson, Marion Averill Lawson, and Catherine Madeline Lawson, in whose memory the flowers at the altar are given. Please join me for the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love, for the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace, and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we show forth thy praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to him from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, St. James's. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for being here with us today. And a special welcome to any who may be visiting with us. We're so glad that you are here, and I hope you'll introduce yourselves and, uh, so that we might offer you some welcome. Also welcome to all those who join us by way of the Internet on Sunday mornings. We're glad that you are with us today as well. Several announcements for you. First, I hope you'll note the announcement the um, article in the front of your Sunday chimes. Nancy Warman and Carmen Germino and so many others do such great work in our outreach ministries around the city. And there's such great stories that we can tell of lives touched, both the lives of those we serve and our lives are always touched. So I want to call your attention to those ministries and to the great blessing that they are to so many. Please remember that we have an organ recital tonight. Jonathan Rudy will be our organist tonight at 7 p.m. giving his recital. He's an incredibly gifted, young, and talented organist, and I hope you'll come be, us, be with us at 7 p.m. tonight. If you're interested in going on the retreat to Cambridge, Boston, uh, to, for the retreat to the Monastery Society of St. John the Evangelist, that will be held March 5th to the 8th. Carmen will be leading that group. It's an incredibly powerful experience, deeply meaningful to go and worship with the monks and live in community for uh, three days. Um, that deadline for signing up for that is coming up rapidly, February 1st. Carmen, as I said, will be leading the group. So if you have any questions or you want to learn more about what goes on at that kind of a retreat, I hope you'll take a few minutes to chat with her about that. Also, 
supper clubs are back. We had supper clubs this summer where we take anyone can, who wants to be part of a supper club is welcome to sign up. And then uh, we divide you up into groups of eight, couples and or singles. And then you um, have suppers in various homes or out on the town. And it's a great way to get to know other members of our parish. Uh, Carmen has been taking point on that as well. And uh, please, the deadline for that is February 10th. So if you're interested in being a part of a supper club, how often will they meet, Carmen? Twice. Twice. So your supper clubs will meet twice, February and March. So um, if you'd like some more information about that, talk to Carmen, but I hope you'll sign up. They're, they're lots of fun. Mardi Gras coming up. Mardi Gras for Mission is coming up February 17th. Please put that on your calendar. I hope you received your invitations. All are welcome. Come help us to support a great, a great missions program here at St. James's. Also, Caritas Shelter Week is coming at the end of February. And if you'd like to help with Caritas, there are sign-up opportunities in the narthex. Now, last but not least, this is Chip Woodson's last Sunday with us as the Director of Stewardship and Development. Chip has been a great blessing around here for so many years. We're really sorry to see him go, but I'm very happy that he gets to retire. So he's very excited about that and spending some time at the river, and he and Sandy are looking forward to spending more time with their grandchildren but I'd like to call them both up so that we can give them a thank you for the wonderful ministry that they've done here at St. James's. As you all know, it, it um, takes quite a bit to, um, here, I'll let you have that one back. As you know, our budget's $2 million almost around here every year, and it's, it's a lot to manage and oversee uh, stewardship here at St. James's. Chip has done such a fa fabulous job these, in all these years he's been with us. He helped us um, to raise over a million dollars for the endowment and the Cornerstone campaign. And more than that, he is such a fine Christian gentleman that it has been a great honor and pleasure to work with him. Now at nine o'clock, we gave Chip a gift. We gave him two gift certificates to, what's, it, what's the name of it? West Marine. West Marine in, uh, where is it? Where is it? Is it in? It's, it's one in Richmond, one in Deltaville. Oh, it's Deltaville. That's the one I'd called. I called the one in Deltaville. Deltaville. There's one in Deltaville. Chip's passion besides Sandy and his grandchildren is his boat. So we got him a couple of gift certificates to West Marine so he can outfit his, for anything he might need in retirement. But at this service, we want to thank Sandy for letting us have Chip for so long. Thank you thank so much. You. <laughs> Last but not least, I forgot to say the good news is we don't have to say goodbye. Chip and Sandy will be in the pews with us when they're not on their boat. So we're glad to have them here. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Grant, we beseech thee, almighty God, that the words which we have heard this day with our outward ears may through thy grace be so grafted inwardly in our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruit of good living to the honor and praise of thy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord.